The following audio is from a talk by Dr. Ken Fujioka. This audio is part of a certified educational activity titled Managing Short Bowel Syndrome with Associated Intestinal Failure, an Expert Perspective on a Patient's Journey. To access the entire activity and complete the post-test, please go online to www.peerviewpress.com forward slash RQE. A printable monograph, slides, practice aids, and other features are also available. Hi, I'm Dr. Ken Fujioka, Director of Nutrition and Metabolic Research at Scripps Clinic, San Diego, California. And today I'm here to talk about short bowel syndrome. What I want to get across is how do you get a targeted, usable history? What's really important on a physical exam? What labs do you need? And you'd be surprised what labs actually may help you out. And also, how do you manage this? What's the best diet? What's the best medications? How do you handle the parenteral support, which is complicated? And then finish off with a newer option that's treating the malabsorption and the actual intestinal failure. So let's use a, a case history of Susie, 44-year-old female. She was in great health and goes in for an elective hysterectomy. She does fine. She goes home the next day. But within a couple of days, she starts to have a little bit of abdominal pain, a little bit of fever, not feeling so well, goes in, gets checked out, gets sent back home, but then comes back a couple of days later, septic, doing poorly. It turns out she had ischemic bowel. Somehow in surgery, there had been either a nick or a kink or something in the blood supply to the small intestine. She lost the main blood supply to her small intestines. They've essentially had to remove it all. She ended up in ICU. She was in the hospital for six weeks and eventually went home. She had a jejunostomy and she was on TPN. You now see the patient two years later and she's hooked up to her remaining bowel. So at least she's hooked up again. She has short bowel syndrome. She has a central line and she's getting parenteral support five days a week or basically five nights. She gets hydration on the days off of TPN. She moves her bowels 10 to 15 times a day. It's watery, it's foul smelling, sometimes explosive, and she's afraid to leave the house. She says, Doc, I'm afraid I'm gonna have an accident. She's depressed. She feels like she's not a good mom. She has two boys, they play basketball, baseball, soccer. She's afraid to go to their games. So what does she have? Yeah, she has classic malabsorption syndrome related to a very shortened gut. And so she has this increased output because she can't absorb. She doesn't have enough bowel to meet her nutritional needs. So she gets behind on hydration. She gets behind on her nutrients, electrolytes, all kinds of stuff. And we see this happening somewhere around when somebody loses be, uh, between 70, 80% of their bowels. And you gotta remember your intestines are 27 feet long, but if they only have short bowel, is only about like one foot, two foot, or three foot, they're in trouble. They don't have enough absorptive surface to do the job. It gets a little dicey between four and five. And if you want the Medicare number, it's roughly four and a half feet or less is short bowel syndrome. And when patients lose this much bowel, there actually is an adaptation. The body tries to grow the bowel, tries to get it bigger, juicier to take over these, the job of absorbing all these nutrients. And it'll do it for up to two years, but pretty much by six months, you know what's going on. They're on TPN, and, and again, you're just fiercely trying to replace all these nutrients. So causes, there's numerous ones. Surgery, it could have been, in this case, it was elective hysterectomy, bariatric surgery, uh, could be a tumor resection, radiation enteritis, mesenteric, ischemic event, throw a clot to the SMA, trauma, Crohn's, all kinds of things. So what happens is now they're dependent on a central line. And central line has its own problems. They can get an infection. They can get thrombosis at the end of the line. The bigger one, which I get, get the referrals for, is they get disease from the parenteral support because the, the liver was never meant to see food infused through the blood. It's used to seeing it coming through the gut. So they get hepatobiliary disease. They get liver disease. They get bone disease. And obviously they get tons of malabsorption. And it's hard to remember that this is a very, this is a tough disease. If you have, you know, at the end of five years, 
a third of the patients may not be alive. In other words, the mortality rate is very, very high. Costly, we're talking one of the most costly diseases we know. Roughly just a bag of TPN, that can be $1,000 a night for each bag. So very, very, very costly. And the last off, probably the most tough quality of life. Their quality of life is so tough because like this woman, she's afraid to go out. Her sleep is terrible. She's hooked up to this IV infusing in. She's got to get up and urinate. It's just a tough life being tethered to this parental support. So not surprising, her biggest complaint is high output diarrhea. And she almost died the first six months because she got so dehydrated that it was hard to keep up with this output. And again, when you're trying to adapt, that's when this hypersecretory type of thing happens. Now, two years later, she's constantly thirsty. She's wanting to eat. She's hyperphagic. She just wants to eat all the time. And again, the more she eats, the more she has diarrhea. She's lost weight. She used to weigh 145 pounds. She's now 112. So her primary care doc is saying, eat, eat, eat as much as you can. Get those calories down. I don't care what you eat. We got to get your weight up. So what's she eating? She's eating a high calorie diet. She's eating cereal with cream, two cups of coffee uh, with sugar and milk. She's got sandwich with chips and a soda. She, and then she used to cook. She doesn't cook anymore. She's just depressed. And so her husband's ferrying the kids around to the different sporting events, comes home, brings home pizza or burgers or fries, and she just eats whatever he brings home. For dessert, she has a big old bowl of premium ice cream, and she drinks water and sodas or juice throughout the day. So what's contributing to this diarrhea? One is she has loss of absorptive capacity, but the other one is she doesn't have her terminal ileum. The distal bowel's been removed. It's been cut out. So she can't absorb her bile anymore. She can't reabsorb bile, so she can't absorb fat. So she gets fat malabsorption. This is a real issue because now here's somebody who has been told to get, gain weight. So, of course, she's eating ice cream and things like that. It just makes the diarrhea worse. So clearly, she has room to fix her diet. Why is she so hyperphagic? Sure, the body's not absorbing, but the bigger one is, all the hormones that are supposed to tell her to stop eating are not there. They're gone because they come from, again, that part of the intestine that was removed. And then last off, she's probably hypersecretory as well. We got a little picture for you that this is kind of interesting, but it tells us that how humans control their weight. And it turns out we're turned on to eat all the time. I mean, sure, we're cue eaters. If, if we know there's food in a certain place and it's free, yeah, we'll probably go there and get some free food. But with that said, um, we're just turned on to eat all the time. And then when we eat a meal, we release about four or five, six hormones that tell us to stop eating. She doesn't have those hormones anymore. So how do you work this assessment out? One is determine the anatomy of her bowels. Two, what's her weight doing? Three, what kind of medical complications from the parenteral nutrition does she have? And this is the interesting thing about labs. The most, one of the most useful labs you can get is a 24-hour urine collection. Surprising, but it is. I mean, sure, you look at albumin, you look at your electrolytes, but if you're going to determine how you're going to change your therapy, this becomes key, and I'll show you how in just a little bit. And obviously, her weight. What's her weight doing? She's already on an H2 blocker. She's on something to slow down the diarrhea. She's on whopping doses of Valium, five to 10 milligrams, three times a day. Now remember, she can't absorb like a normal person, so it's not uncommon for these patients to get on pretty high doses of drugs. You and I would be afraid to take those kind of doses. Her labs are abnormal. Liver function tests are not on. Her ALT is 152, her AST is 81. She's on a fairly typical TPN mixture, a little bit high in calories because they're, they're trying to get her to gain weight. So she's on 70 grams of protein, 325 grams of dextrose, and 35 grams of fat per day. So when you look at this, these abnormal liver function tests, you've got to make some decisions. Is this fatty liver disease? Is this TPN-induced liver disease? Is this due to the lipids? There's, there's multiple causes. So if you're in all in doubt, send them to your local gastroenterologist who can do a biopsy and give you, you know, the definitive answer. In this case, because I see the ALT is twice the AST, I'm going to lower her dextrose. That's going to be my first. But this looks to me like fatty liver from just too much carbohydrates. 
So what I do is I lower her dextrose, and she's on a whopping dose, 325 milligrams, that's a lot of dextrose for a little lady. So I'm gonna lower that, say 200, and go from there. The next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna swap out her fat emulsion. As you know, there was a very recently approved new fat emulsion that may have a better effect on the liver. So again, you can swap that out. And then last off, whatever you can do to lower the number of days on TPN. If she's normally on six days a week, see if you can get it down to five. Do whatever you can, give that liver a rest. So what's your treatment goals? Fairly straightforward. It's gonna be lower output, lower output, lower output. In other words, she's gonna be happy, you're gonna have less problems to deal with get adequate nutrition, and then somehow, whatever you can do, increase the absorption of the remaining intestines. So what do you do? Number one, you gotta teach nutrition. They gotta have a very good understanding of how to eat. She was eating very inappropriately. She wasn't eating multiple small frequent meals, get her to do that. Two, gotta lower the fat. She was way too much fat in that diet, and again, she can't absorb fat because she's missing that section, so it's actually gotta be a low fat diet. Get your dietitian involved. Get them to teach him that diet. And there's, there's tons of literature, stuff they can pull up. Her water, her fluid intake was wrong. So when you have short bowel syndrome, you can't absorb free water or hypertonic water. You need water that's in between. So something like G2, coconut water, things that are kind of just a little bit of salt, a little bit of sugar. Because as you know, when you absorb sodium, potassium, or glucose, you actually pull in water too. So that's active absorption. Otherwise, you need a long intestine if you're gonna do regular old passive absorption. And then last off, if you can do something to optimize the absorption, start it. And I'm gonna talk about a new class in just a second. Earlier I talked about when you eat a meal, you then release a whole bunch of hormones to tell you're full. One other hormone released from that same L cell is called GLP-2. And what it does is, instead of going to the brain and telling you you're full, or going to the pancreas and releasing insulin, it goes back on the intestine and gets them to grow bigger so they can absorb more nutrients. That's kind of a neat little trick. It's, a, believe it or not, a minute-to-minute -minute hormone so that when we have food around, we can grow the intestines, get this food. If we don't have food around, we lower the hormone, the intestines shrink back, we don't have to spend as much metabolic energy on the intestines. So it has its place, it's, it's a very old hormone, and it's been around for a while. So it's a 33 amino acid protein, and it's released by the L cells. Now you might know the L cell because there's a whole bunch of other cells, excuse me, other hormones that are released by the L cell. GLP-1, PYY, and some of these are available for diabetes and other, treatment, uh, to other treatments that are not related to short bowel syndrome. Most of these GLP-2 receptors and releasing factors and hormones that will make it are in the distal bowel. So they're not in the gastrum, they're not in the duodenum or the small amounts. You see most of it in the ileum and the first part of the colon. So again, unfortunately, many of these patients have had that section removed, so it's not surprising they struggle making this. But its job is to increase the growth and absorption ability of the nutrients. And it does this again by just being made and feeding right back on the intestines and it's released in the one-to-one -one ratio with all the other hormones that are controlling things. It's cleared by the kidneys. And the native GLP-2 has a very short half-life, seven minutes. So the year, 2016, and we're looking at tadouglutide. So this is available. This is a hormone that's been altered so that it stays around for longer than seven minutes, it stays around for several hours. You can inject it once a day. And it, if you look at the you know, little pictures you have available to you, you're gonna see they swap out one amino acid, that's all. So it's homology is almost identical to native GLP-2. So what that means is it'll work just like GLP-2. And so the very first study, just 21 days long, they gave it to 16 patients, and what they found was there was this very impressive increase in nutrient absorption within just three weeks. Fat, nitrogen, sodium, potassium, and the biggest thing was calories. They increased their calorie intake or absorption by 200 calories per day. May not sound like much, but if they weren't on it, they were losing 250 calories per day. So net gain, 450, I'll take that in a heartbeat. The bigger one though that made me just, just 
jump for joy and really happy because again, fluid, you know, trying to handle this fluid absorption, these folks, is really hard, is that within three weeks, 21 days, they were absorbing close to a liter more per day, a liter. Or in other words, they weren't urinating off a liter per day. This is a big deal. And what happens is now their urine output increases. So earlier I said one of the things you want to look at is 24-hour urine output. Guess what? This is where you want to look. And so these patients clearly are peeing off more than 500 cc's a day. That's a win for everybody because, again, now you can start lowering your parental support. There's another slide in there that you can look at that shows the course of this medication over a whole year. And what you see is, which is quite outstanding, and they now have two-year data that shows the same thing, it just gets better and better. So sure, it gets better at three weeks, but it gets better at six weeks. It's still getting better at the end of a year. So that by that time, they've dramatically decreased their need for so much parental support. And actually, some patients come completely off of their parental support because they do so well. When we were talking about, then how do you deal with this patient who has short bowel, they're struggling, they're starting to get in liver problems, whatever, every day you can get them off TPN, in other words, just hardcore nutrient through the veins, is good. They looked at how many days were lowered, twice as many patients on tadouglutide, or GLP-2, the, the, the hormone that's available to you now, came off a day or more per week. So in other words, instead of being on six days a week, they were on five days a week. And it, again, just got better and better and better the longer they were on it. So again, you can get them another rest day. And again, there were patients who came completely off. So what, did, what are the risks? What are these side effects that we need to be worried about? So abdominal pain is actually at the top. This is tough because the placebo group had a lot of abdominal pain. As a matter of fact, about a quarter, 23% had abdominal pain. But if you look at the uh, study group on drug or on hormone, about 31%, so it's a little bit higher. And there were two types of pain that we saw. One pain was uh, because you're growing bowel, you may be pushing it into adhesions or they, they could possibly get obstructed. All kinds of things happen. So that was acute. That was the minority, but they could get that. Most of the time, it was just kind of this dull ache that they said it just felt uncomfortable and it went away with time. So you really need to talk to the patient, get a feel for what's going on. And I usually would ask the patient, would you like to come off this? And they go, oh, no, I, I don't want to stop. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going to the bathroom every 30 minutes. This is great, doctor. Well, I'll hang in there. And yes, it typically goes away fairly quickly. Nausea, stomal complications, abdominal distension, any intestines that are now growing, they got, they got a little tummy now. One of the things you want to keep an eye on, though, is stomal complications. So because you're growing the intestine, that the stoma can grow. So you need to tell your ostomy nurse, hey, I'm going to start a hormone that's going to help them absorb more nutrients, but the stoma may grow, so get ready to swap out their appliance to the next size up or change the type, and they'll know what to do. Most of them have seen this before, so they're ready for it. And then as expected, one adverse event that went down was there was less diarrhea in the group that got tadouglutide. So what are the contraindications to using something like this? And it can be numerous things. One is if they've had a GI cancer before or pancreatitis, you don't want to give it. If, uh, and then who do you give it to? So they need to have short bowel syndrome and they need to be dependent on parental support. They have those two things. Go ahead and start. They're ready to go. But again, make sure they don't have a GI cancer. Make sure they don't have pancreatitis. So let's get back to Susie. So she starts to do glutide and she does really well. She sees the dietitian who specializes in short bowel syndrome, so, so she gets very good advice. Her diet improves, she's taking the med, and within two weeks she says, you know, I'm doing better. This is a lot better. As a matter of fact, I want to start lowering my TPN. I want to get off this stuff. So she's on five nights a week. She's doing well from her standpoint. Her husband says, you know, she seems a little spacey, a little slow. So what did we miss? What did, didn't we do early on when we were looking at her meds? Yeah, you're right. She's on Valium. She's on big doses of Valium. And now she's absorbing it better, more. And so she's getting higher doses. So yeah, she's getting zonked. So what, what do you need to do? Yeah, just lower it. Lower it down so it's working. And you know, 
the, the, the moral story was she did so well, we were actually able to get her completely off. She was really, she just said, quote, I got my life back. You know, and so again, she did well. She, did, she could go to her kids' games. So she was really happy with that. Again, there's different algorithms for how you do this. The hydration side, to me, is the more important side. It, the nutrients will fall in line. In other words, if their albumin's good, their weight's good, yeah, you're home free. But look at their urine output. If they're peeing out more than a liter a day, there's a chance you might be able to cut back on their parental support. If they're peeing out more than two liters, definitely, it's time to cut back. You're doing well, you're ready to cut back. And again, see if you can get them off one day a week. That should be your goal. So as we say, it's a team sport. This is really one that's really a team. I mean, I got a pharmacist, dietitian, home care nurse, me, the caregiver at home. I mean, this is, this is a pretty big team and you need to keep everybody online, communications open. Generally speaking, I find either the dietitian or the home care nurse becomes the main voice of the patient and they're directing, okay, this is what we need to do, this is not. And you need that because one, it's not that easy to get a urine output, that's tough. If you can get a stool output, great, but don't feel hard on that one, that's a tougher one. If they have an ostomy, it's usually pretty darn easy. They need to keep track of how much fluid they're getting down, obviously measure their weight, and again, if they get problems, see us, and then last one, adjust the meds. Don't fall behind on the meds. And again, anything with a narrow therapeutic window, you need to keep an eye on. Well, I realize I've talked a lot. I've talked about a really tough disease. And, you know, my hat's off to you guys who are on the front lines treating this disease. Because this is, I, by far, this is the toughest disease I know to treat. And up until now, we haven't had a lot of treatment options. So, again, thanks for listening. Because I know you don't get reimbursed for your time when you do all the labs and all the TPN and all other stuff. But thanks for hanging in there, and I appreciate it. Thank you for listening to this activity. To view the rest of the CME activity, download materials, and complete the post-test for instant credit, please go online to www.peerviewpress.com forward slash RQE. This educational activity is supported by an independent medical education grant from Shire.